He is the congressman from Florida. He is Congressman Byron Donald, and he is a friend of the Will Cain Show. And he is rumored, not just rumored, he's listed on the short list as a candidate for vice president. You ready, Congressman? You ready to be vice president? Um, you know, I think, you know, the VP stuff, it'll take care of itself. Like, I really do believe that. Um, you know, I came, I got decided to even run for Congress uh, really to try to help shape politics overall, do great things for my district and put our country in a better position. So, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not a lifer. I don't think I'm going to be around forever. I, you know, I gave myself 10 years to do this. I'm now in years, in year three, year four, really in year four now. Um, and I got a shelf life. I, I think that politics is not something that you spend your life doing. I think you go for a while, you do your job, and then you go back to normal life. And, and, and trust me, as the years go by, sometimes I do think about um, normal life more and more. What do you want to do after politics? Actually, I would probably go back into finance. Uh, I was a finance guy before I got into politics. I'm securities licensed, 766. I had a book of business. I spent 20 years in banking, insurance, and then financial services was my last stop. And, you know, I do miss the business. It's a great business to to just con- to, to work in. Uh, you help people accomplish their dreams. So, you know, I probably would end up going back. Um, but, you know, you never know what life has for you in the next step of your journey. So whatever that is, I look forward to it. You could end up on ESPN's first take. You know, you, you talked about, I know you're a big fan. You <laughs> yes, know, sir. You know, now we're about. talking. Let's go. <laughs> well, you know, it, this, okay, this is actually a great transition. You talk about, you know, we need people from different walks of life. And I know what you're referencing, you know, you know inner city Brooklyn, you're black. But there's something that, you know, I've thought about you and I, and maybe it's our mutual love of sports. You just invoke um, Bill Belichick. But I noticed this when I was at ESPN as well, like, I, I'm not looking to get too like philosophical about race, um, but I, I had this unique relationship with a lot of the guys at ESPN, specifically, well, not exclusively, but but specifically the black guys at ESPN, where they came at me with a certain level of skepticism because you know I don't want to say my politics, but my 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 bias, my ideology, my point of view was obvious on first take, and then they would find out, and this is kind of my characterization, Congressman. That that I'm just kind of a dude. I'm just a guy, you know, like I like sports. I like to give each other a hard time. I like to laugh. I like to have fun with one another. I don't take myself too seriously. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons you and I have hit it off to some extent that whether or not you're black and I'm white, we're both dudes, you know, and and as I look across Washington, Congressman, I'm not sure there are a lot of dudes. And I'm using that phrase because it's just kind of like it's the same thing you would encounter in a locker room. It's the same thing you would encounter in so many different walks of life where it's like, yeah, we could be at a bar. We could be talking sports. We could be over each other's house. We could be having a good time. Right. That doesn't mean there's not differences in our experiences in life, but there is like a, a common thread. And I'm curious, like, do you see that a lot in D.C.? Because I don't see a lot of dudes in Washington, D.C., uh, I mean, look, I'll, I'll put it this way. You know, there's a handful of members I hang out with where, you know, we talk normal life. We don't just talk about what happened on the floor or what's happening with the leadership or anything like that. I think because even us, you know, we need to be able to decompress. You know, there's a handful of guys. We go grab cigars and we'll have drinks or we'll just hang out and just talk mess, watch games, whatever. And you, you got to be able to do that, man. I mean, you got to enjoy life. Um, you know, life on Capitol Hill can be stressful. But at the end of the day, we're still people. And I found like even when I was in the state legislature, there was a handful of guys that I just hung out with. And, you know, we always would chop it up and, you know, you have fun, crack jokes and and just be men, even though there's an awesome responsibility, you know, that we have. So I I would say what I I would say what you're saying is accurate. Um, You know, look, there's a lot of different ways to get to Capitol Hill. Um, You know, some people are political lifers and that's all well and good. That's just not been my experience. And so, you know, okay, I like to, so, you know, spend time with guys who are just who? fun. They have a good time. Who? Who do you chop it oh. up with on Capitol Hill? Oh, man. I hang out with Corey Mills. I hang out with Rich McCormick. Pat Fallon will hang out. Me and him will hang out every now and again. Wesley Hunt, my guy to Texas. You know, we, oh, man, Wesley's a, he's a fool. He's a character. So we always have a good time. <laughs> uh, Mark Green, who's actually going to be leaving us soon. A bunch of us are getting together in a couple of days. We're going to hang out. Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of us that just get together periodically. Um, in spite the schedules and in spite the travel. So here's a relationship I'm curious about. Um, I'm curious about your relationship with Jamal Bowman. 
Congressman, Democrat, New York. Uh, yeah. You're originally from New York. So I imagine you and Jamal have some some similar life experiences or, um, you know, I don't know if you grew up the same way, but, you know, you know, grow up in the same town. You have some commonalities. Um and I saw that video. I don't. You may have done it more than once, where you and you and Congressman Bowman have been on the front steps of the Capitol, basically doing an episode of first take <laughs> over some kind of congressional issue. And I'm kind of yeah. curious, like, what is your relationship like with Bowman? You know, actually, is is you know, it's pretty good. It's a good relationship. We know we don't see each other too often, but when we cross paths, you know, we say hello. You know, engage a little bit, see what's going on in his world. See, uh, you know, with, with respect to family, like, man, how's your family doing? How's my family doing? Uh, stuff like that. What happened on the steps was just purely organic because one of the first conversations we had was nothing about politics. It was football. And we were talking about the Giants at the time. And so, you know, we were just going back and forth over football, talking about different teams, uh, how we saw the season going. And so every time we would talk, we would actually not talk politics. Um, one of the things that most people don't understand is that there's not a lot of debating that goes on in Washington. Uh, there's actually very few debates in Washington. Everybody just kind of gives speeches and they go on about their business. So when you see a member and you you engage, you end up talking about something that you find common ground on. For us, it was football. So then when I got down to the state, we would argue like, you know, you argue like you argue in a, in a barbershop. So we're arguing over football like that. And then when they have, came to the Capitol steps, because we had already engaged in, in that kind of in that back and forth before, then the cameras just got to see it. But it was about politics and it was about, um, I think it was about the time it was about President Trump and Joe Biden and he was like, what about Ron DeSantis? And I was just like, yeah, come on, man. We Everybody knows that Ron DeSantis is better than Joe Biden. You know that. Almost like how it's in the barbershop, we have that conversation about who's better, you know, uh, Michael or Kobe or LeBron or who or who's the better quarterback, Peyton or Tom Brady, or now you got to put in Patrick Mahomes. I mean, this guy's phenomenal. But those are the conversations we would have behind the scenes, and, you know, it's spelled out for the cameras to see. Is he any good on football? Does he know what he's talking about when it comes to the Giants? No, I mean, like football and politics, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but that's okay. It's my job to educate him. <laughs> Did you educate him on fire alarms? Did you teach him what, when and where you can pull a <laughs> nah, fire alarm? Nah, I stayed away from the fire alarm stuff. So, you know, he talked to me about it briefly, and I just looked at him, and I'm like, come on, dude, really? Like, bro, come on. And I just left it at that. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? we just moved on. I saw that. I saw that. And again, like, you know, it's it... – how do you say this? Like, I'm not, I can't say, Hey, I know black culture, but like, I've kind of been surrounded by black culture much of my life. I'm from a small town in Texas. At the time I was growing up, it was white and black. Now it's like every other town in Texas and across most of America, heavily Latino. Um, yeah. but, um, spent years obviously in New York. My kids went to school in Harlem. I worked at ESPN. And I think a lot of people might have seen that interaction with you and Jamal and been like, wow, that's tense. And I actually saw it and I was like, I think these two dudes might like each other. Like they're enjoying this debate right here on the steps of Capitol Hill. Oh no, we did. That's the funny part. Everybody, people who don't know, or if you've never really seen an encounter where, you know, you have men just go back and argue. And the best way to explain it is the barbershop. Cause in the barbershop conversations, they get intense, but it's always in good fun. And everybody knows when it crosses that line, because you can see it's a different look. Like there's no more smiles. You know, there's no more loud talk. Things tend to actually get a lot quieter and they get more direct. But no, I'm just being honest. Things get quieter. They don't get louder. Yeah. Um, but, you know, between he and I, it was just, you know, that's just how guys get down in the barbershop. And that's how we argue. You know, I think, um, you know, I think as LeBron has that show on HBO where they're sitting in the barber's chairs and they get into those debates and sometimes they get a little rowdy. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes somebody's trying to explain a key point. I think those are really that's really how men typically engage. Um, and so it's just different when the cameras see it, because I think especially with, you know, with the political press, they're accustomed to everybody coming out and be like, I want to talk about what my good friend from New York said. And I, have a <laughs> disagreement. I don't know, we don't we don't talk that way in real life In real life. We get after it. And I think it's important for people well, to see that and understand that you can have those arguments or disagreements or whatever and still be um, respectful towards one another. 
Yeah, well, they're not dudes. That's the thing. Like, you know, when Chuck Schumer comes out and does his thing, I mean, I'm pretty clear. He's not a dude. Uh, no, now we're going to come not. back to the barbershop no. in just a minute. I, I want you to talk to me about this week, okay? Um, there is today Mike Johnson, uh, Speaker Mike Johnson, Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, Joe Biden are all meeting. They're, they're attempting to work out some kind of funding resolution to keep a partial government shutdown from happening. There's talks over Ukraine. There's Republicans have held, many Republicans have held uh, firm on the inclusion of some type of security for the border. Um, what I'd love to hear from you is Speaker Johnson's going to have a – he's got a real challenge here because he's got to somehow find a, a win for both Republicans, I think like yourself, who necessitate something uh, significant at the border, uh, at the same time working with Democrats to keep the government funded. So I would ask you this. Describe for me a win. Border security is the only win. Well, I, I just got to tell you uh, what's happening. We're going to be around 10 million entrance encounters at the southern border. Uh, that's crazy. That's just pure insanity. The major cities can't handle it. And so, you know, my advice to the speaker is make sure you have 218 Republicans for whatever deal you negotiate. Because if that if you have 218 Republicans in the House, that means you're going to have a good a good deal that can secure the border. And I'm a realist that on this matter right now. Uh, the government's going to get funded at some point. Um, if you were going to ask me what matters more right now, 20 billion dollars in additional government spending or securing the southern border to stop another two to three people from coming into the country this year, I would say it's it's securing the border over the 20 billion dollars. It, it's not even close. Uh, we know we have a massive spending problem. We got to fix it. The Democrats don't want to do that. Um, but you can't take in this amount of people into your cities, into your towns, into your states and not have major repercussions down the line. And I think you're already starting to see it. Describe for me the win on securing the border. What could you get from the Biden administration and from Democrats? It would be a win for our southern border. Remain in Mexico, ending uh, parole and catch and release. I think that those would be two major wins. Uh, there's other things you could do around family separation, stuff like that. And, and I think it's important for people to understand that right now, the Biden administration does not do DNA testing at the border when, when children come across with a adult that they say is a family member. There is no DNA testing. So nobody knows if that's truly the family or not. The cartels and the coyotes know as long as they send an adult over with a child, the child will get in and the adult will get in regardless if the adult is actually the parent. I mean, that's just crazy to me, but this is what happens in Biden's America. So I think you have to reinstitute that. Um, the other thing is um, there's a it, we have to put in place where if you want to apply for asylum, don't apply for it at our southern border. Apply for it either in Mexico or at the U.S. Embassy in your country or the next closest country. Don't give the coyotes and the cartels ten thousand to eighty thousand dollars to be shipped into the United States. We have to shut all of that down. So I think that's a win. Now, Democrats would say uh, that's that's uh, that's inhumane. But my counter to that is the only thing that's inhumane is knowing that young girls are being sold into sex slavery and knowing that there are migrants who are dying in the back of tractor trailers because it's too hot because there's no there's no air condition in them and they're dying of heat exhaustion. Like that's inhumane as far as I'm concerned. But look, you have a situation where the radical Democrats in our country, they've been wanting this policy, Will. This is the policy they've always wanted. They've always wanted massive open borders. Now they got it. And my concern is, is that the American people are seeing now how terrible of a policy this is, and it's not going to work out for our country. Why do they want massive open borders? Uh, because I think in their view that the United States is the is the one opportunity for a lot of people to be successful. And I, I do agree with that. It's a great opportunity for people to be successful. And they view that having borders and restricting immigration is not in the best interest of people. Um, but my my concern as a member of Congress and even as a citizen is not about what everybody in the world wants. It's about what's best for the United States of America. Um, look, to, to simplify it, man, everybody's had a, everybody in their life. If you're if you're a dude, you've thrown a great party. You've had a great party at your house. Everybody comes over. People are calling you be like, hey, I didn't get an invite. And you're like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Things were busy. Come on by. Here's the address. Come through. But at some point, the party's over. 
and you can't stay. You know, when I was in college, they would say, you ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here. And that's the situation in the country as well. You can come to our country, work hard, make something of yourself, but you can't, you got to come the right way. You can't just try to just, you know, just to jump into a party you weren't invited to and then think you can stay just because you walked in the door. That's not right. And if that's how we deal with our own homes and our own property, we should deal that way as a nation. But the Democrats don't feel that way. They have been wanting it, this open border strategy for a very long time. They feel that um, no nation should have borders, that people should be able to move freely in order to just make the best of themselves. But the reality is, is that you have to maintain the order of a country, because if you don't do that, you don't have order. If you don't have order, you can't have a strong economy. If you can't have a strong economy, people in your own country suffer. And that's to the detriment of the American people. That's why I'll never support it. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think it's a at, at the end of the rainbow, it's a lack of a belief in the nation state or the virtuousness of the nation state and some empathy driven idea that, you know, you've got to have open arms to anyone who is in in need. That's actually I think the philosophical end of the rainbow, I think it's also generous because I do think there's some strategic stuff at play as well over the short term when it comes to changing the electorate. Um, you know, when you brought up DNA testing and you brought up asylum. The case in Georgia is an illustration of both of those where the, the illegal immigrant um, killed that woman at the University of Georgia because uh, from what we know, I believe he had an, uh, an arranged or a, a marriage of convenience to avail himself of the asylum laws. Uh, I don't know if the child he came over with a woman. They had a child um, with them. I don't know genetically if it is his child, but they claim family status, um, which helps their ins- asylum claim. Um, and you see right there that that's a case where your potential solutions um, very probably could have had a positive impact that averted the murder of a young woman in Georgia. Now, the question is, I think, Congressman, if you got all that, and I think all of that is unlikely because, well, there's a Democrat Senate and there's a Democrat president. But if you got all that, do you think Republicans, could you get those Republican votes? Could Speaker Johnson get that if the price was... Sixty-one billion dollars for Ukraine. Uh, I think I think the better way to say it is is that you would get the votes on the floor. Now I'm, there are members of our conference who are not going to vote for Ukraine funding. Uh, it's not the majority of our conference. It, it is a minority of the conference, but they just won't vote for it. But I think that if you had the border secured, uh, even though they wouldn't vote for Ukraine funding, uh, they wouldn't be they would be less. Uh, I guess. Uh, upset about Ukraine getting money for its border while America remains unsecured. I I think that package can definitely pass on the House floor if the elements of border security are there. But but this is why uh, Speaker Johnson's comments to the president have been very clear and they are morally correct. You have to secure our nation first before we're going to secure another nation. That just makes sense. And so I think that you get the border package done um, I think if that border package, as I described, got done, you would see the vast majority of Republicans vote for aid for Ukraine along with Democrats, and that money would go through. I don't think the $61 billion is needed. I think they probably need about $34, $35 billion, most of that going towards lethal aid. The rest of it is like humanitarian costs and so on and so forth, and I'm not sure – there are enough votes on Capitol Hill that want to continue to be in that business because we've seen that money actually not get into the hands of the people who need it the best. That money is siphoned off into other uh, apparatuses that I I don't think it's in our interest to be funding anyway. Okay. So I I had you describe a win. Now I'm going to ask you what's going to happen with this, with this debate over funding. What I think is going to happen is, is that there's probably going to be some short term kicker continuing resolution for a week or two. I think there's going to be probably two uh, uh, appropriation bills. We call them a mini bus and a mega bus, or there'll probably be three mini buses. And what I mean by that is, is that they'll put two or three of the appropriation bills together in a package, and that now creates a mini bus. If you put eight or nine of them together in another package, that's a mega bus. The thing that nobody wants to see uh, on our side is an omnibus package, means you put all the spending into one bill. And the reason why nobody wants to see that is because Typically, what happens when it's all in one bill, that means somebody in the leadership in the four corners stuck stuff, put stuff in that bill that nobody will find out about until after it's already signed into law. 
And that's how you get some of these stupid programs to get funded that, that end up pissing people off because they got jammed all together in one bill and nobody had a chance to read it, review it, object to it. Um, even staff members missed these things, uh, but somebody stuck stuff in there because they knew they couldn't get it passed on its own in a standalone vote. So that's what I think is going to happen. I think you're going to see two or three appropriation bills that will follow a continuing resolution. All right, back to the barbershop. Yeah. The best player in the NBA is undoubtedly, without debate, Nikola Jokic. What Today, do you say, Byron? In Donald? the NBA? Today. <sighs> man, I, I got to give it to Yoke, man. He's the finals MVP, two-time MVP. I mean, look, it's right now it's between Yoke and Embiid, but Embiid gets hurt too much. And I love Embiid, but he gets hurt too much. And Yoke, man, the Joker, man, this guy's... <sighs> He if you doesn't were starting jump. a franchise today. <laughs> it, I know he doesn't hardly run. If I, if I, if you were starting a a franchise today, you would rather have. I mean, I'm a homer, but I'm also right. You would rather have Joel Embiid than Luka Doncic. Give me Luka Doncic. Actually, if I was starting today, give me Anthony Edwards. That boy's oh, he's special. No. Yes, he's good, Anthony Edwards. On. Oh my, he is special. Here's my problem with Luka. Luca's phenomenal. I'm not sure how many years I'm gonna get out of Luca. That concerns me. What do you mean? It concerns me physically. Yeah, it's it's really about his his physical nature. I mean, Luca. I mean, he's a big boy now, but as he gets older, he's gonna have to be able to keep, you know, keep his weight under control because it's only gonna hurt his athleticism. I mean, his game isn't an athletic game, but it will hurt right. him in terms of staying healthy. That's my only concern about Luca. But Anthony Edwards. Oh man, this guy. He, he, vision, you're a rare athletic specimen like him. Vision doesn't age. A brain only gets better. And that's Luca's superpower. Seeing angles, seeing passes, seeing the floor, controlling it not just with your speed, but with how mm -hmm. slow you can go as well. I have no concerns that age forty Luca will be LeBron James. No, no, I, I totally disagree with you. Luca gets hurt now. You don't get – listen, uh, he's a, he's on another no, he network. Shannon Sharp says it better than anybody. You don't get healthier playing professional sports. You just don't. You get nicked up as you age. It happens to everybody. Well, I mean, you know, we're not in our 20s anymore, but I know every every once in a while you get up and your back is just bothering you for no reason at all that you just slept different. You know, it just – it happens. <laughs> and so my concern for Luca is – Le LeBron is a he's the best athlete I've ever seen play any sport anywhere. And he takes care of his body. You cannot confuse LeBron James and Luka Doncic in terms of care That's and concern fine. for their body and their athleticism. I'm sorry. You just can't make that everybody's comparison. doubted him that this everybody's doubted him through this point. I mean, I'm I can't believe it's like people just give me gold. You know, they just they just leave it on the side of the road and I pick it up. You know, like I'm the one that said Stephen A, your boy Shannon, which by the way, if you invoke Shannon Sharp on a basketball debate, you're usually losing. Um <laughs> it, and it, you know, you're just leaving gold on the side of the road for me when it comes to Luca. Uh I, I you know love what we Luka, should do? I do. Love Luca. But we I should have you on on Fridays. It's the Will Kane Show sports exclusive podcast. And then we just do sports for one hour. You and me. Listen, count me in. We could do that. Listen, I, I, I got to tell you, man, I love talking sports. I don't get to do it much. Love sports, you know, love football. I was talking to a couple of my friends. I was like, man, the Chiefs going to win this Super Bowl. They're like, no, no, they're not. San Francisco got the better team. And I said, they do. But Patrick Mahomes is different. Different caliber, That's right. Different guy. Just That's right. Is. Different level. Patrick Mahomes. Congressman Byron Donalds. I mean it. Um, I'll always tell you when I think you're wrong, but I think you represent one of the potentials for inspiration and a positive vision for this movement moving forward. So um, I appreciate you, and I appreciate you being on the Will Kane Show. Hey, listen. Thanks, Will. Thanks for having me on. Take it easy.